Shalom from Jerusalem. This is TV7's Israel at War update. As we continue to deliberate the latest developments from here in Israel, throughout the region and beyond, it's always important to note how this war began. 230 days ago, on October 7th of last year, the Islamist terror groups from the hamas plague Gaza Strip launched an onslaught on southern Israel, declaring war by perpetrating a massacre, murdering some 1,200 mostly civilians, wounding over 4,800 others, and kidnapping 246 people, including elderly, men, women, children and infants. 128 of them remain in Hamas captivity to date. Let's now turn to our TV7 editor at large, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, the uh, days increasingly become more and more eventful. And yet, uh, with that, we'll try and keep it focused, short and to the point. What can you tell us about the various theaters at play? So, at least uh, three uh, theaters have been very active uh, over the last uh, 24 hours. In Gaza, uh, there's fighting in the north, in the Beit Hanun area, which uh, almost uh, borders the uh, town of Sderot and uh, the uh, uh, village of Erez. And uh, three Israeli soldiers uh, have been killed there. Others have been uh, wounded, uh, some of them badly, in uh, firefights uh, with uh, Hamas uh, squads. Um, in uh, Rafa, the Israeli operation continues, and notably, when uh, Secretary of Defense Austin called his counterpart, the Minister of Defense Gallant, uh, overnight, he did not repeat the American warning against a major Israeli operation. He only spoke about the shared interest in uh, conducting an operation against the remnants of uh, Hamas forces in Rafa. So there is at least a nuance there. And uh, in Lebanon, uh, there has been a barrage of more than 30 projectiles uh, shot by uh, Hezbollah uh, into Israel, but Hezbollah also uh, lost uh, some uh, key officers uh, who were assassinated by the Israeli Air Force. Now, on the uh, diplomatic front, there is some expectation uh, in Israel that uh, tomorrow, Friday, the um, International Court of Justice, not the ICC, uh, which of course uh, was active earlier this week, but the ICJ, could order tomorrow the cessation of hostilities, a ceasefire uh, in Gaza. And uh, of course, we have followed the proceedings of the court last January, but there has been one important change since we last followed the court. And that is in February, a Lebanese jurist was elected the president of the court. And uh, in the case of a tied uh, court, the uh, president can uh, cast the deciding vote. So this may become important. Indeed. Well, with regard to the later point, uh, the latter point, excuse me, uh, on the ICJ, you know, could, would, some may claim should. Uh, we'll have to wait for uh, tomorrow to see how it evolves. In any event, Israel should be vigilant. And from what I hear, at least uh, here, the foreign ministry, which is leading this initiative alongside the National Security Council and other actors within the Israeli government, uh, they are operating uh, very systemically when we're talking about the ICJ, since uh, ultimately, if we look at all the data at hand and the reality on the ground, the, the law is in Israel's favor. Uh, thankfully, I say so. With regard to uh, Hezbollah, uh, they did announce this morning uh, the 312th casualty uh, who was killed by uh, the IDF uh, over the course of several months now, uh, since October 8th, when they entered into the fight alongside the Islamist Hamas, hoping to exert a certain cost from Israel that to our Joy, to their dismay, has not materialized uh, with uh, too much effectiveness other than the fact that a security line has been established within Israeli boundaries 
for the first time since uh, 1948, if I may say. Uh, so it is quite uh, dramatic on that front, something that Israel uh, at large, but the government in particular, has to contend with. And, and this is unfortunately not seeing, at least it's not yielding fruit at this moment in time, but we hope to see a certain development uh, in favor. But with regard to the Gaza Strip, uh, the operational planning uh, that was conducted by the IDF uh, prior to the launch of the ground maneuver into Rafah has been quite successful with over 1 million residents, uh, non-combatants, displaced, of course, uh, initially towards Rafah, have relocated to designated locations that have been uh, identified by the IDF as no combat areas. So uh, they are safe there, of course, from the IDF. Uh, the, the safety of uh, those non-combatants from Hamas uh, and uh, other mobs is already a different story. But let's turn now to uh, the former chief of intelligence of uh, Mossad and a senior uh, officer at the IDF intelligence directorate, namely Brigadier General in Reserve, Dr. Amnon Sofrin. It's good to see you, General. I'd like to uh, initially talk with you about specifically the discussions uh, that uh, ensued with regard to the hostages are negotiations once again on the table? Are we seeing some sort of reignition? Or are the statements made by Qatar about being just before a total collapse uh, more accurate at this point? I believe that uh, the Israeli government, one more time, is trying to make uh, any effort to come to some negotiations that will, uh, in, in the end, bear fruits and bring some people at least back home. Uh, what we see right now is, uh, first of all, that Egypt is more involved than it used to be before, and it's getting deeper even though they try to mislead us and to uh, change the equation with Hamas without acknowledging neither us or another Americans. And of course, that uh, makes us and Americans very furious and uh, kind of uh, misbelieving them. But nevertheless, I will try to go on. The Israeli government uh, may be now trying to uh, ease a little bit the terms after uh, watching the horrible clip that was uh, released last night about the abduction of uh, this uh, young lady uh, observers from Nahalos that was horrified just to look at. And I think that uh, that made something uh, move within the Israeli establishment to keep on and try to release at least part of the people that are imprisoned there. Uh, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure how many people are still alive. I hope as many as we as can, but uh, I think that nobody can tell that for sure, but uh, we'll make, perhaps we'll try to make one more time any effort to bring them back home. Joined with military pressure, which is uh, the announced tactic of uh, trying to apply pressure on Hamas that would then capitulate to Israeli demands to release at least some of the uh, hostages. Hopefully they are alive and will continue in hope and pray uh, for their safe return. But uh, uh, it, it's a very difficult situation uh, altogether, uh, to say the least. Let's now turn to the commander of the Israeli Air Force Task Force for Air and Missile Defense, Brigadier General in Reserve, Don Gavish. It's good to see you, General. Uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, naturally, the, your colleagues at Air and Missile Defense have been very active uh, during the past 24 hours, pretty much daily, but also during the past 24 hours, dealing with barrages of rockets, missiles, unmanned aerial vehicles uh, being launched from Lebanon into Israel, also a number of uh, projectiles launched from uh, the Rafah area towards uh, different points, uh, also within Israel, but also within Gaza against IDF troops. What, what can you tell us about uh, the preparedness on the one hand, but also the efforts to contend with this reality since uh, we're seeing this evolve? Uh, there, there is no real antidote, uh, antidote sorry, uh, to contend with this on the northern front in particular, unless Israel really engages Hezbollah head on uh, entering into Lebanon to degrade Hamas, uh, Hezbollah, excuse me, from its capabilities. 
Well, uh, indeed, uh, Jonathan, this is uh, quite a challenging uh, situation, but allow me uh, to refer to two notes, uh, to, to, to two uh, of the points that were uh, just, uh, we, talk, we just talked about. The first one is uh, what is happening in Rafah, and you mentioned rightly so, that uh, almost uh, one million uh, Palestinians were uh, relocated uh, to areas that were specifically designated uh, for your humanitarian uh, needs. And this is something that, you know, before getting into the Rafah, there was some time people were asking, okay, what is going on, why we are not moving, and so on. We could, uh, now of course, we, we could say to prepare those things, it takes time. Uh, and more than uh, once we said that the IDF is doing whatever it is needed in order to prepare himself to this uh, Rafah uh, operation. And this was one of the major operations that was done uh, by the IDF. This is the first thing. And the second thing is that, you know, we see what is happening in The Hague, in other places. This was the main effort of the IDF to guard the people, to make sure that they have their safe zones. So the way that we are conducting the war, you know, it is to see it again and again, the, the amazing effort that is being done by the IDF, unprecedented, no one did it in the past and, and, and it is being just b being ignored. It's, it is really incredible. It's, a, it's an upside world, the upside down world on this point. Uh, the other thing I, I would like to uh, that I would like to refer to is what was mentioned by uh, by by uh, Doctor uh, Sofren. Uh, you know, it's uh, we saw those uh, five uh, young soldiers, and uh, the, what I was really looking at, and you know, it was it was really a horrible uh, scene to see them in this uh, situation. A few minutes before they saw those uh, terrorists uh, that they are slaughtering the the. Um, the mates uh, over there, uh, but they, they they brought, I think, a lot of uh, proud uh, to all of us. They were not in panic. They were coordinating uh, with the, uh, with those uh, terrorists. They were uh, calmly uh, as much you could be in this uh, situation. And it says a lot about their personal personal uh, resilience and uh, and strength and. Uh, Again, under this terrible uh, situation, I think that we could be very proud of on those uh, young uh, soldiers that uh, we know that they did everything till the last minute. They were coordinating with the forces. They were talking with, with everyone that they needed to, to talk with until uh, they were captured by those uh, terrorists. And now going back to your question, I'll be brief, uh, uh, Jonathan. It is, uh, of course, a, a challenge uh, uh, mainly in the north, and uh, you are right that uh, once you are only on the defensive, it is much more uh, challenging. The full-scale doctrine to deal against uh, rockets and missiles, uh, it's uh, to apply the, the four known uh, pillars. It's attack, it's alert, it's active defense and passive defense. We saw it, by the way, in the Gaza Strip. We saw once the attack part was uh, very significant as it is. Basically, there are no more rockets toward uh, the center of Israel. They do have some capabilities, but, but the magnitude is completely different. And this is what would happen in the north. If, if we would come to a, a point that would be a war, it won't be only uh, us uh, uh, operating on the defensive uh, part. We would be also operating on the offensive part and the, on the part and the results uh, I believe would be plus minus same as they were uh, in uh, the Gaza Strip, uh, although it is much, much more complicated. We all understand, understand it. We say again and again, it is not hermetic, uh, but uh, I think that we have a quite a strong defense to our uh, big cities in the northern part of Israel, military installations, strategic installations, and so on. Let me start by remarking on the five female soldiers. Uh, first of all, I, I must say our hearts go out to, to the families uh, who uh, agreed to release those uh, horrendous videos of uh, their daughters uh, that were kidnapped by those savages uh, who were talking there. They were using terminology in Arabic that referred to those five girls as, as 
pretty much concubines, uh, uh, captive uh, women, which uh, under Islamic laws can be uh, pretty much done with whatever they want. Uh, so uh, there are really a lot of uh, issues coming out of there if you really understand the depth of the cultural understanding and religious uh, perception uh, of uh, those people. It's just, it's vicious. And we need to put that also in context since the people who pledge allegiance supposedly to Hamas, they don't pledge allegiance to Hamas, they pledge allegiance to the Ahwan, to the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which has very specific doctrine of how to act against uh, the haram, uh, the, the non, uh, non-Muslims, so to speak. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's really, I, I must say, the uh, let's hope that this doesn't happen to anyone and that they don't have to experience this. And the international community needs to do more. Uh, there are still German infants there, uh, there are still French uh, children there and people there. Uh, there are people from Canada, from the United States, obviously. Uh, so uh, many of the Western civilization, but also uh, uh, other uh, Pacific countries, Australia and others, uh, they also have citizens in there that uh, I, I don't see them speaking about those hostages, their own citizens, enough. And it, it just doesn't make sense because how can you... Uh, push for the plight of people who do need help, but they need to be freed from Hamas on the one hand, but not be as vigilant and as uh, open about the need to to save your own citizens. I, I just, I don't understand that. But let's turn to uh, Mr. Owen. I'd like to ask you, the, the Israeli foreign minister, Israel Katz, traveled uh, to France together with families of uh, a number of the hostages at a time when France is brokering uh, uh, various arrangements to try and reach a certain uh, cessation of hostilities arrangement with regard to Lebanon. What can you tell us about that? Uh, is there some light at the end of the tunnel? Well, you know, when you speak about the tunnel, uh, people have uh, some uh, image of uh, what uh, the IDF is encountering in uh, Gaza and especially in Rafa but uh, it is completely superficial. And what experts are saying is that uh, the major tunnels kept by the Hamas leadership resemble underground parking lots, not uh, just one level, but for instance, um, in your own uh, building uh, where the studio is, uh, you have uh, minus one, minus two, and uh, sometimes the uh, Hamas tunnels have minus three and minus four. And uh, in order to get from minus one to minus four, where uh, they are hiding, it's very, very difficult. You can hardly uh, get in the machinery uh, needed. Now, <clears throat> as for the substance, rather the, the, uh, the metaphor, the, uh, the clip uh, which was shown and which you referred to was intended mostly for domestic consumption. It was intended for uh, the decision makers in Israel and for the public to put pressure on these decision makers so that their position in the negotiations over a hostage deal would be more flexible. And indeed, it uh, did have uh, that impact because the uh, new position or the updated position which emerged emerged from the uh, emergency war cabinet uh, overnight was somewhat more flexible. Now, uh, Hamas uh, uh, demands uh, three points, basically. The release of uh, prisoners in Israeli jails. Uh, this is difficult, but surmountable. Then the uh, end of the war, um, again, uh, this can be phrased in a different way, sustainable, calm, and the like, and the uh, withdrawal of Israeli forces and uh, uh, raising the uh, siege or the blockade, blockade over Gaza. As long as all of these demands, when they are met, are not phrased in such a way that Hamas could claim total victory, it is possible to achieve it as long as uh, General Sofrin uh, said, 
that there are still some hostages alive. Uh, let, let me put it this way. In, in my opinion, when it comes to Hamas, uh, the, the remarks by Otto von Bismarck, uh, the Chancellor of the Second Reich, uh, should be taken into account. And that is, when war comes, take all treaties and throw them in the bin. And they need to deal with uh, this uh, Islamist terrorist organization in one way that they will never raise any head uh, ever again and that they may run as uh, headless chickens. Uh, for the rest of their lives. But that's, uh, of course, a matter that uh, the IDF is pursuing right now and should continue to persist. Uh, so is the Israeli government, and I think that they're doing rightly so. They cannot accept Hamas's demands and this war, if not uh, reaching a achievement in which uh, Israel dictates to Hamas the terms and conditions of its surrender. Uh, it needs to continue uh, unrelenting. And I say this with a lot of sorrow uh, because we all know what that uh, also means. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, if we reach an ar uh, arrangement where they understand that their end is near, uh, Yahya Sinwam, Muhammad Def, and all those wicked individuals uh, will ultimately capitulate. Uh, General Sofrin, I'd like to ask you uh, something and I, I will phrase this carefully since uh, uh, there is public knowledge on this. Uh, the subterranean infrastructure in Lebanon far exceeds that of the subterranean infrastructure in the Gaza Strip. With years of documentation with regard to North Korea assisting Hezbollah alongside the Islamic Republic of Iran and others uh, to construct and dig uh, this subterranean infrastructure. Uh, and I, I'm asking myself, a war against Lebanon will therefore also include a much longer campaign that Israel had ever had uh, with, uh, with regard to uh, degrading Hezbollah to a point of no return. First of all, let me say as follows. I'm not sure that uh, all the rumors about uh, North Koreans assisting uh, Hezbollah to dig uh, this uh, tunnel is, uh, is true. Because the Iranians have the knowledge, the Iranians can assist them, and the Iranians did that for many years. It's not something new. It's not, this is not a new phenomenon. We don't know the extent of these tunnels, of these underground tunnels in, in Lebanon. We saw what happened with those tunnels that were aimed to uh, lead people into Israel that were blocked by us a few years ago when uh, General Gadi Eisenkot was the chief of general staff. But you know that uh, we know that inside Lebanon, in some areas, there are nets of tunnels that are resembling something like Gaza and even bigger and even stronger. The second issue is to get to launch a war on Lebanon, on, on Hezbollah, doesn't have anything to do with what happens with Hamas. Hezbollah is much stronger. It has much, much more power, uh, fire, power, firepower. They can launch a lot of rockets and a lot of missiles into Israel to uh, many ranges, uh, up to a lot. Uh, let's say that the assessments are uh, resembling that uh, in the case of war with Hezbollah, they can launch at least 3,000 rockets a day. And that's a lot. And I'm not sure that uh, we can block all of them together every day on a daily basis because of uh, lack of ammunition and so on. But nevertheless, the fighting against Hezbollah is not fighting Hamas. Razon forces are much stronger, much more equipped, and much more trained compared to uh, Nukba forces in, in Gaza. So getting into some uh, engagement in Lebanon is going to be very long, very annoying, and there's a lot of fire coming out on both sides. And that's something else totally different than in Gaza. General Gavish, 3,000 rockets a day, that's uh, uh, not a lot less than what was fired over the course of roughly 30 days during the Second Lebanon War. And therefore, I'm asking, uh, obviously, preparations are underway. We just spoke yesterday about the new battalion of uh, air and missile defense, namely an Iron Dome uh, battery. Uh, what what needs to be done in order to ensure that 
these capabilities, naturally, they won't reach to 3,000. I'm very skeptical about that uh, since uh, the offensive activities while they are firing are also taking place in conjuncture and therefore uh, much of their infrastructure will be devastated. Um, I can just imagine the devastation that will take place in Lebanon. Uh, nevertheless, it will hurt to, uh, Israel as well. What, what should we prepare mentally for in this uh, situation? Well, uh, you're right, uh, Jonathan, by saying that uh, it, they, this, we would feel the strikes. Uh, there is no doubt uh, about it. Um, but, you know, we also had time to prepare ourselves. Uh, we had almost uh, seven months to prepare ourselves and 10 years uh, before. And uh, basically the way that you deal with it, it is first with your doctrine, and I just mentioned it before, of uh, the, the attack part of it, the alert part of it, the passive and the active defense and the combination of all those uh, um, uh, strategies uh, together allowed us uh, to minimize as much as we can the, the damage uh, here in uh, Israel. Uh, I think that, you know, we should prepare ourselves to something which is much more uh, greater than what we've seen uh, with uh, Hamas, and I agree on this. But, you know, just maybe to, to give some context, uh, let's talk about numbers. Uh, today, and up to date, Hamas shot uh, toward Israel more than 13,000 rockets. That's quite a lot. Uh, if we would see how many people uh, died from those 13,000 rockets, uh, what happened uh, to our installations, uh, bases, uh, cities, and uh, so on, uh, you know, we could we could uh, take it very proportionally. We have less than 10 people that were uh, severely damaged from, from those numbers. So uh, um, we know that uh, the capabilities are there, but we also know uh, what we can do against it. We saw what happened against uh, missiles that came from uh, Iran, uh, which might, which were much more, much more uh, sophisticated, uh, accurate ones, and all those. And uh, once again, we saw the the results. So uh, we say we say in Hebrew, "Lo alman Israel." Uh, I'm not sure that I know how to uh, say it in the right way in in English, but but we have. The, our capabilities. We know that it won't be easy, uh, but I'm quite confident that uh, if we would go to a full-scale war, uh, let's let's put it this way: I wouldn't like to be a, a Hezbollah fighter or Hezbollah terrorist uh, uh, during this war. We have a few more forces and capabilities that uh, the enemy does not know about. Uh, and therefore that uh, will stay in the shadows until the moment of truth. But uh, this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank General Sofrin, General Gavish, and Mr. Oren for your insights. I'd like to thank all of you at home as well until our next update from here in Jerusalem. Shalom. My name is uh, Doron Gavish and my background uh, 30 years of uh, serving in the Israeli Air Force. My last job I was the commander of the Israeli Air and Missile Defense uh, during the uh, introduction of the Iron Dome to the Defense of Israel. All of this allows me really to be part of the team here in uh, TV7. It is uh, super important to have uh, such a platform. Uh, we talk about the global situation, we talk about Israel and uh, those uh, different angles uh, which are relevant to the discussion.